So you all are welcome in today's series. And as I said, we are going to uh, have a session of statistical mechanics today. And then from tomorrow, we'll have a mixture of statistical mechanics as well as nuclear physics. And then probably some, uh, some, some other subjects will also be touched upon. And therefore, uh, it'll be a nice experience to rejuvenate and revise everything. So with these words, I stop sharing uh, this particular slide. And since you all know me very well, therefore, it is definitely sufficient. It is definitely sufficient to, <coughs> it is definitely sufficient. Am I in the, am I in the, this thing more? Yeah. So, so in this series of learning physics with conceptual and problem-based approach organized by the National Academy of Sciences, India, uh, NASI, Delhi chapter, we have this 10 week course started on 27th of July. And in this course, we are having a lot of uh, physics subjects, classical dynamics, electromagnetic theory has been already almost over. And we are now persisting with statistical mechanics and are about to start with nuclear physics. And later in the next week, uh, later in the next week, we will also probably start with classical mechanics and hence the intended gap from 10th to 19th of July has been, um, has been, uh, has been filled with physics lectures, uh, depending upon and because of the good response, uh, I can, I can uh, uh, see the good response of the students through your feedback. And because of the feedback, we decided to not keep a break between 10th and 19th of August and hence you're having persistent classes even during this course. So with these words and since I am well known to you, most important thing is that I am very happy to serve all of you as science students. My motto and aim in life is to serve science education and to help every science student, especially physics students, uh, to establish their careers in physics. And with these words, I stop sharing uh, so today I'm going to have statistical mechanics with you and if time permits an introduction to what I'm going to do with you in nuclear physics and, and now I uh, continue with this. So, um, <clears throat> I will now share, I will now share the other slide with you. So just give me a moment. So Ms. Moini, please unmute yourself and tell me whether you can see my slide being shared with you all. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, thank you. So students, today uh, we are going to, um, so you might be wondering why do I still have an opening slide called Basic Concepts of Statistical Mechanics. I'm having this slide because uh, as mentioned in my ladder of books, I completed uh, studying statistical mechanics with you from the book of Beiser, Concepts of Modern Physics by Beiser. And, um, and, and now I'm going on with the next level book, uh, which is slightly more detailed than Concepts of uh, Beiser, uh, Concepts of Modern Physics by Beiser, and that is the book of Gurg, Bansal and Ghosh. Dr. Pushpa Bindal, Dr. Pushpa Bindal, my co-convener, is there with me, and uh, we hello, both. Hello, Dr. Yeah, hello, Dr. I can't start the video. Hey, with the, uh, oh, oh, yes, okay. So one second, uh, one second. Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. You can now you have your own controls. So I, I said this, the number of students studying with us are static, so they do not need a daily introduction of mine. And hence, I started off with just two sentences that uh, today I'm going to go to the next level of statistical mechanics with them. And then I shall give them a 
give them a small introduction of what we are going to do with them for nuclear physics and later we'll have detailed nuclear physics lectures also and if possible some other subjects would also might be covered in the coming two three, two, three days and that's what i told them so we are trying our level best to give them a flavor of each and every subject of each and every level and all types of numericals and uh, support material so they have been now getting all material that is available with us and so this shall continue. So this is it. I will now then continue. Can I continue with the uh, lecture? Please, you are most welcome to enlighten your knowledge of statistical mechanics. So I welcome Dr. Punita Verma to start sharing the Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So as I said, so the second level of statistical mechanics is the is slightly detailed. So in the beginning, you had two lectures which gave you a complete summary of statistical mechanics, right? Just the mention of the formulae, some numericals, and some brushing up of concepts. And on popular demand, that is from your you uh, students, we uh, it was decided to do detailed classes also of statistical mechanics because this definite this subject definitely requires a lot of conceptual clearing especially because any kind of research material or study texts available in this particular subject pose the understanding in quite different manner, two distinct manners, as I've already told you. Now, in basic concepts of statistical mechanics, today I'm using, using the reference of Doug Bansal and Ghosh with you. And with, in this uh, book, we move one step ahead and we start seeing the very simple way how and why we are doing something. So it is clear to us that statistical mechanics is a study of macroscopic systems. Whenever we consider any system, we are bothered more about the macroscopic behavior of the system and we are not bothered about what is the behavior of the individual particles that are there in the system. And how do we do this? We do this by taking statistical averages. We do this by taking statistical averages. So the method of statistical averages, since it is employ, employed in statistical mechanics and therefore the name. This part is already clear to us. And now, one point at which I would like to clear is that which comes to not normally to a student's uh, mind, and it is the following, that where does this H come from here? So if we do not talk about radiation, if we do not talk about radiation, how is it that everywhere we, were, we are still talking about small H, the Planck's constant? And is this small H, the Planck's constant, which we know as Planck's constant, does statistical mechanics, while using H, the alphabet, mean always the Planck's constant or could it be something else also? So the answer is that for classical statistical mechanics, H while being used to explain the phase space volume is not the Planck's constant. I repeat, in classical statistical mechanics, uh, the small h alphabet, which is being used to define the phase space volume is not Planck's constant uh, H as known to us. What is it? We shall see today. Now, uh, through, my last uh, through my last few lectures, it is clear to you that we must understand phase space. And if we do not understand phase space, we cannot go ahead. This is the first thing. What is statistical mechanics? It's clear to us. How does it bridge between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics? That is also clear to us. S is equal to K, L and W is the bridging equation. That is clear to us. W is the thermodynamic probability, clear. W also means the frequency of the microstate within a microstate. This is also, we have something which have, we have understood to quite a good level. So next comes the question of the phase space. So I've already defined that phase space is a space which, which is a space having a combination of both the position space as well as the momentum space. And a student automatically says, how do I imagine 16 dimensional space? And we say, you cannot draw it, you have to imagine. You have to imagine a six and dimensional space. And that is the phase space, which has got three coordinates of um, uh, position, x, y, z, and corresponding three coordinates of momenta, p, x, p, y, p, z. The moment we say this sentence, the moment we say this sentence, one second. So it is got stuck. I'll have to stop share and start sharing again. So uh, just a second, it's get, my slide is getting st stuck. 
I would like to again share it. Yeah. So in order to in order to move further, we have to also we have to also immediately think of the uncertainty principle. Why? We say we know very well that in uncertainty principle, what do we do? We say that the uncertainty in position and momentum is connected through this equation delta x delta px has to be greater than or equal to h cross where h cross is h by h the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi this fact is known to us very well now obviously we also know in this uncertainty principle that the identical relations are valid for the y and the z components so we can we always write delta v delta y delta py is greater than or equal to h cross and similarly Delta Z, Delta PZ is greater than or equal to H cross. So equation number 12.1 A, B, C is known to us very well. And if we combine all these three equations, we can say that capital H, let's, let's take another uh, uh, alphabet, capital H, and we can say that this is greater than or equal to H cross Q. Now, why in the world am I talking about uncertainty principle here at this situation? I'm talking about uncertainty principle here in this uh, situation of statistical mechanics understanding right in the beginning because a point in a phase space is designated by the six dimensions x, y, z, x, y, z, three coordinates of position and three coordinates of momentum. Okay, and we know that if the uncertainty principle is to be obeyed, which it must obey, which it must obey for subatomic particles. For subatomic particles, uncertainty principle must be obeyed. Why? Because it is the very basis, the very basis, basis of quantum mechanics. The very basis of quantum mechanics is the uncertainty principle. It is not possible to simultaneously determine either the position or the momentum with, with complete accuracy. If you do so, an error will crop up. And what is that error? That error can be estimated through the famous Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. Now we just think back about phase space for a fraction of a minute. So a phase space is a six and dimensional space which has got three coordinates and three momenta and they are combined together. So in a phase space, if I plot a point, then that point is called a phase point. Whose phase point? The phase point of the system we are talking about. Whose phase point? The phase point of the system we are talking about. How did you get the phase point in the phase space? We got the phase point in the phase space for a particular state, which we are considering by just noting down its three coordinates and its three corresponding momenta. And I explained to you that if now, and this is, this is the state of the system. What is the state of the system? The state of the system is completely specified by specifying these six coordinates. Done. Now, if the system moves, then its coordinates will move, its momenta will change, and hence the phase point will travel out in the phase space in the form of a trajectory, in the form of a trajectory. Now, with these two points that are clear to us, let us try to understand how this uncertainty principle is going to help me uh, understand the whole situation in a better way. <clears throat> For that, there is necessity to understand that if there is a phase space and it has got, it, it, suppose phase space had only three uh, uh, dimensions, yeah? only three, just like our normal life. We live in a three dimensional world. So if you, wherever you are sitting, if your room had a zero of the graph in one corner of the room and one side was X axis, the other was Y axis and perpendicular direction Z axis, then your exact coordinate could be measured with the help of any scale that you draw on the sides of your room. If that is the case, if that is the case, your coordinates are specified. Now, if you start dancing with some uh, music in your room, then your coordinates will change, your velocity will change, and hence your momentum will change. And then your movement, if it is plotted in a three-dimensional graph, will give me your position and your momenta. So suppose, so suppose I now in your room draw a very small volume and I look at that volume. 
what will be that volume you'll say the volume will be having a dimension of dx dy dz that's the volume of a cube i consider a very small volume and i say the dimensions are dx dy dz and then i find out the probability that what is the probability that you will cross this volume while dancing what a simple example to understand so you are in a room you are stationary then you put on music then you start dancing and in your room somewhere within your room i draw a small volume having the vol having i draw a small cube having a volume dx dy dz and i find out the probability what is the probability that while dancing you will cross that volume what do i have to do i have to then have a sensor in all the side on all the sides of your room along the walls which have capability of assessing your position and your momentum and then i know the where i've drawn your volume cube and there i can find out the probability i think it is very easy to understand and example that i give you now come back to the phase space the phase space has three more dimensions then what will be the volume like the volume will be dx dy dz and for the other three dimensions dpx dpy dpz dx dy dz because of three and for three more dpx dpy dpz wonderful now in this six n dimensional space my volume is this here why am i talking about all this what is the relevance the relevance is profound why is it profound because it is this dimension of the volume of a unit cell drawn in a phase space having six n dimensions which decides which decides whether i will use classical statistical mechanics or quantum statistical mechanics and and it will also make us understand what is the difference between classical and quantum statistics so what is the difference the difference is the following the difference is the following the difference is that classical statistical mechanics says the classical statistical mechanics says that the volume of the phase space the volume of the phase space can be as small as possible so in your room where you're dancing if i want to draw a cube having three dimensions then i can make the cube as small as i like the classical statistical mechanics has no constraints on the size of the volume of the unit cell that you are considering in the case of your dancing within your room okay now you can translate this example for a particle in a, a coordinate uh, the axis geometry and you can say that the classical statistical mechanics cst i will call uh, cs uh, csm what i call in short form classical statistical mechanics csm so csm says <clears throat> that volume can be as small as possible if you now go to the phase space then you can say the volume can be the volume can be as small as possible but what does quantum mechanics says so quantum statistical mechanics qsm says that no you cannot make a volume of a unit cell smaller than h cube you cannot make a volume of a unit cell smaller than a smaller than h cube and that is the profound important uh, profound statement profound fact of difference between csm classical and qsm quantum so classical says make the unit volume of the cell as small as possible i have no problem make it as big as possible i have no problem but qsm says no you can make it small but you cannot make it smaller than h cube where h is the planck's constant but what does csm say csm does not call that h as a planck's constant but it says uh, it doesn't matter whether h it is h or use any other alphabet make it as small at is as big as you like fit in only one particle within that unit fill, on, fill fit in only one particle within that uh, cubical volume or fill as many particles as you want i'm repeating csm says that the volume of the unit cell in the phase space having six n dimensions can be anything it can be as small as possible or as big as possible fit in only one particle or fit in many particles i am not concerned 
QSM says, this is not the case. You have to make a unit volume in a phase space in such a manner that it is not smaller than H Q, where H is the Planck's constant. And that is why this concept of uncertainty principle is a thing to be understood and related to our case of phase space. So let us look at this example. The total number of states available to a particle confined between zero and X zero and zero and P zero. So we have just drawn a two dimensional diagram as you can see in the figure here. The total number of states which are available to a particle. You have considered a particle and you're going to calculate the total number of states available to that particle confined on the X axis between zero and X zero and on the Y axis between zero and P zero. So what will be the total number of plates, uh, total number of states? The total number of states will be total area, which is X zero P zero divided by H. And what is H? It is delta X into delta PX. And similarly, for a six dimensional volume, N is equal to total six dimensional volume. Okay, which will be what? Volume for the position coordinate VR and multiplied by volume of the momentum that is VP divided by H cube. What is H cube? Delta X, delta Y, delta Z multiplied by delta PX, delta PY, delta PZ. So the number of states is very correctly equal to DX, DY, DZ, DPX, DPY, DPZ divided by H cube. And hence the importance of uncertainty principle in our phase space. Now, uh, now, so if that part is understood, then the obvious thing that comes to our mind is, how do we move further? We have understood about phase space, we've understood about um, uh, H, and we've understood why H in CSM is not really the Planck's constant, but in QSM, the quantum H is really the Planck's constant. Now, uh, yesterday, uh, yes, the day before yesterday, I already spoke about photons and phonons. Phonons, not so much in detail, but only a little bit I spoke about because of the, uh, the, the, the phonons are the quantities which are responsible for the vibration of the solids, electrons in the conduction band. We did not go too much in detail and I did not speak a lot about phonons. That is uh, Fermi Dirac statistics in uh, detail, uh, uh, in Fabubo uh, Einstein statistics in detail helium atoms, etc. We shall do that in the last class of statistical mechanics. So the separation between the neighboring states, which neighboring states? The states which are there in a system, those states, what is the separation between them? The separation between them is about KBT, where K is the Boltzmann constant into the temperature and T can be said taken to be equal to uh, 300 kelvins. Now, look at air molecules. Now, in solids, it, KBT is about 2.6 into 10 to the power minus 12, minus 2 electron volt. But in air molecules, the separation between the neighboring states is about 10 to the power minus 20 electron volt. Look at the difference. In such cases, if we now want to calculate the total number of states that are accessible to the system, in these cases, we can we can then what do? We can do what? We can integrate. And the summation of the states which we were doing earlier can be replaced by an integration over dq bar dqp divided by hq. This is a logic which is not presented sometimes in books which are dealing with this. Why can we go from a summation of states to an integration of states? Now, as, as I said in the beginning, that we assume that there are no interactions between the neighbors as in a perfect gas. We are always speaking about a perfect gas because we don't want to take care of the interactions. If there are no interactions, then the particles can access an entire domain of the phase space. Entire domain means what is available access. What are we trying to do? We are going to calculate the number of accessible microstates. This word was also used by Dr. Sanjay in his PPT explaining accessible microstates and non-accessible microstates. However, in most of the study material, this is not dealt with it in great detail. And one must, one must think about what is the difference between accessible and <coughs> non-accessible microstates. So, 
So if the interactions can be ignored, as in a perfect gas, the particles will have access to the entire domain of the phase space. And if the system is confined to a volume V, and we can carry out the integration in all the three directions for momenta, you can use any coordinates. You can use r theta phi. You can use x, y, z, whatever is convenient to you. And then we arrive at equation number. And then we arrive at equation number 12.7 where integration over six quantities leads to four pi v by h cube integration of p square dp. Why, why is only p square dp left? You see, the volume has already come out of the integration. The volume has already come out of the integration. And this, is, this equation should remind you of the particular equations that are pointed out that I pointed out in the case of um, in the case of uh, the, our last two lectures, where we use the concept of a sphere, the four pi p squared, four pi v p squared dp. Uh, the sphere it was around in the second lecture of statistical mechanics that I explained how you get this value. So v is the volume in the Cartesian space, and for non-relativistic cases, we know e is equal to p square by two m, and using very simple mathematical formula. One second. Using very simple mathematical formula, we can then write the 2 pi v by h cube. So we substitute instead of momentum, the energy, and then we get the density of states. The density of states written here as capital D was the same kind that we used in Bizer also. This density of states calculation in both this particular book material and uh, Bizer is similar. So what have we tried to achieve? We have understood the difference between QSNM and CSM. We have understood how uncertainty principle comes into play. And now using that very those concepts and the fact that there is no interaction and there is a density of states, we try to calculate the number of density of states and which can be done by equation 12.9. The range of integration is defined over all values of available energies. That means it will be dependent upon the system. Now, if you compare these two equations, we can write DE, DE, DE that is density of states dependent upon energy as a, along with derivative of energy to be equal to equation number 12.10. Done. This is quite similar to what we did. So if we now move ahead, we have to now quickly think about three different uh, cases or examples which we are already well aware of. The first one is a particle in a one dimensional box. This is very well known to us because in our course of quantum mechanics in graduation itself, we study, this is the first example of quantum mechanics applied to a one dimensional box. A one dimensional box, that means a particle confined in a box whose walls are tending towards infinity. The particle is somewhere in between zero to L. The particle is somewhere between 0 to L. And what do we do? We know the boundary condition that the wave function associated with the, with the particle will be 0 at x is equal to 0. And it will be 0 also at x is equal to L. These are the boundary conditions. And we write down the Schrodinger wave equation in the two regions. And uh, after writing the Schrodinger wave equation in a differential form, we get a solution which is given by equation number 12.11. Shy x is equal to a sine kx plus b cos kx. We define this constant k. Here k is not Boltzmann constant. It is equal to 2me by h cross square. And k is equal to n pi by l, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, or any integer. Substituting of these values of n in k, one can write down then an expression of shy. This is the net result of a particle in a one dimensional box. And we again get energy eigenvalue from the Hamilton, uh, from the Schrodinger wave equation, h shy is equal to e shy as equal to this. So this is a one page summary of the application that we study in quantum mechanics in the beginning. What are the end results? The end results is the shy, the wave function associated with a particle, some particle, which is within the boundary walls of a one dimensional box with its walls having a potential tending towards infinity. And the energy eigenvalues of such a case is equal to this. And as we can see, 
e depends upon n square pi square h square h cross square divided by 2 ml square so sorry i just press the button too early so energy eigen value depends upon n the principal quantum number these are constants and the dimension of the box fine why are we mentioning this particle in a one dimensional box here in statistical mechanics the reason why we mention out this out here is because Statistical mechanics, when applied to quantum cases, that is atomic and subatomic particles, these particles are embedded in some kind of potential. These particles that we are talking about, whether it is proton, neutron, or electron, or any other particle uh, near any other Coulomb potential or non Coulomb potential, is actually suffering a perturbation, a potential. And what do we have to do? We have to resort to quantum mechanics. Uh, as a as a as a solution for us and what's the solution associate a wave packet to a particle consider its wave motion consider the wave function chi apply schrodinger wave equation what for why should we do it we should do it in order to get the wave function back as it is and the energy eigenvalue well very good that means if we follow this procedure we get the energy of the particle which is embedded in that particular potential, okay, and then see how statistical mechanics is connected to it. Now, for example, if we talk about potential energy of an electron in a crystalline solid, then we know that a particle which is, uh, uh, so these is, uh, empty circles are positive ions, and the spacing between these positive ions are the lattice distances A. So if the lattice has points uh, of positive points like the following, please excuse me just for a moment. Extremely sorry for the interruption. So, <laughs> this potential energy of an electron, which is in a crystalline solid, if the positive ions are having a spacing A, the electron in between the lattice points suffers this potential V as shown by figure 12.5. So, the electron is actually experiencing a very strong field. Now, how do we define the state of the electron? We can define the state of the electron by using either the example of one dimensional box or using the example of a three dimensional box. Either using a one dimensional box or using the example of a three dimensional box such as here. So a particle in a three-dimensional box is no different. It is just that we are now considering three dimensions. And then in this case also, the wave function psi can be written in the similar manner as equation number 12.14a and its energy eigenvalue can be written as equation number 12.14b. What is the difference? There is no difference except the fact that it is for three dimensions. That's for the first direction, uh, for only one dimension. Therefore, the energy levels for a free particle in a cubical box can be denoted as pi square h cross square 2 mv to the power 3, 2 by 3. And these principal quantum numbers in three different directions, nx square, ny square, nz square, which can be written as c n j square, which can be written as c n j square. Now, now. The interesting part comes now that suppose we don't have one particle in a three-dimensional box, we have n particles in a three-dimensional box. Where are these n particles coming from? 
these n particles are coming if they are not coming they are present within any thermodynamic system that we are considering if we are considering n number of particles which are present in a particular system and for example electrons in a solid we know we have already talked day before yesterday about the how the conductivity of electrons in metal can be explained by quantum statistical mechanics only huh? we have also discussed about specific heats of solids See, in all these cases, whether it is a solid or, or, or a metal that you're talking about, you have n number of electrons present in that particular solid or metal. And hence, those n particles are experiencing potential. And that particular potential can only be understood or gauged or calculated by using quantum mechanics application of what? One particle in three-dimensional box and then extrapolated to n particle in a three-dimensional box. Well, all wonderful till now. So, what do we have? The total number of particles in an energy state corresponding to a particular level is called as occupation number. These very small basics look very trivial. And the moment you glance at the book, you start thinking, oh, I know this very well. I've studied a whole course on quantum mechanics. This is nothing to be touched upon. And there lies the whole mistake where you miss the connection between how quantum and uh, statistical mechanics have to work together for you to uh, infer anything about the behavior of any thermodynamic system which is obeying QSM. So the total number of particles in an energy state corresponding to a particular level is called occupation number or you can call it occupancy. So in Bayesian we were calling it occupancy, here we are calling it as occupation number. And the sum of occupation numbers over all levels gives the total number of particles n. And this equation number 12.16 tells us why in every thermodynamic system, the overriding constraint is that the number of particles in a system cannot vary. How can they vary? They cannot vary. We are not talking about grand canonical ensembles. We are talking about microcanonical or canonical ensembles in which the number of particles in a system that you are considering is constant. Example here is of electrons in a solid or a metal. Now since all the particles in different states corresponding to any level having the same energy Ej, the total energy of the particles in the jth level will be what? How much? So you're considering a level, say jth level. And you're saying how many particles have the same energy? I say let's answer is 10 out of 100. Okay, so 10 electrons are having the same energy. And then we ask how many electrons are having next energy and so on. So if you keep on summing all of them, then what will it be? The total energy of the system will be a summation of Ej and J, where Ej is the energy of either one state or more than one state. And this is the reason why we talk about degeneracy. This is the reason why we have this overriding constraint that the energy of the particle, particles in a particular thermodynamic system must remain constant. I hope you can see the correlation between the various lectures that you've understood or heard from us. And you're also able to correlate how you read and understand books like uh, Rife, etc., who do not go so much in details or who are given for understanding these particular small quantities. So, using either a particle in a one dimensional box or a particle in a three dimensional box, we have understood the application of quantum mechanics to statistical mechanics because all subatomic particles have to be related with their wave function. Next. So, having understood that much. Now we come to the concept of microstate and microstate, which I'm sure you all are very much aware now. And <clears throat> the schematic representation of energy levels, their degeneracies and occupation number. So in some books, they call it occupation number. They some, in some books, they call it occupation index, NI by GI. And then in some places, they call it occupancy. One in the same thing denoting is a little bit different, a bit different. So let us look at this graph. You have three energy levels, E1, E2, E3. And in the first uh, level, you have three particles. In the second level, you have four. And in the third level, you have two particles. Okay, so N3 is equal to two, N2 is equal to four, and N1 is equal to three. And, and 
G1 is equal to 1. There is only one energy. One, there is no degeneracy. However, level number E2 and E3 have a threefold or a fourfold degeneracy because all the four particles in E2 have the same energy. So it's a threefold degeneracy. It's a threefold degeneracy. Why threefold? Because if you look at these perpendicular bars, which are actually making open ended boxes, then there are three substrates that are there in the energy level and the particles are, are being adjusted into it. So far, so good. With this revision of the concept of microstates and macrostates, we understand that if we are looking at the totality of a particular compartment, if we have made two compartments, then if we look at the complete thing, then it is macro. And if we are looking at micro arrangement or permutation, then it is micro. So a glance at this table tells you immediately that you are now capable of understanding that if you had one box with two compartments, one and two, and if the macro state was 0, 4, then it is 0 ABCD, where ABCD are individual particles. How many micro states does it lead to? It leads to only one micro state. However, if you have macro state of 1, 3, then if you use A particle in compartment number 1, then B, C, D in compartment number 2, and there are four ways of arranging this. The number of microstates is the frequency. It is also related to the probability. And hence, if you keep on following the table, which I don't need to do it in great detail with you, your microstate can be 0, 4, 1, 3, 2, 2, 3, 1, and 4, 0, where these numbers simply means how many particles in which compartment. If you have more than one particle in one compartment, then you can arrange them. Why can you arrange them? Because they are distinguishable and therefore B, C, D, C, D, A, D, A, B, A, B, C in compartment number two here are meaningful arrangements. So this is another point which we must understand. What is the difference between meaningful and meaningless arrangements? If we understand this, only then we understand why in our uh, derivations we have to have certain factors to be reduced by dividing them by a certain uh, uh, factor why, why do we do some kind of divisions what are we trying to do or what do we mean by meaningful and meaningless arrangements so meaningful arrangement is b c d c d c d a d a b a b c these are all meaningful because they are all distinguishable particles but if we had only a a a a then in the second case, 1, 3 will simply become equal to A here and A, A, A here and that's all. And then the number of microstates would reduce from 4 to just 1 because it is meaningless to arrange A amongst each other. It is meaningful to arrange B, C, D like C, D, A or D, A, B, but meaningless to keep on arranging the A in the middle to the A in the right and the A on the right to the A in the middle. What does this simple example teach? The simple example teaches us that if the particles are identical, if they are indistinguishable, which is the case of quantum statistical mechanics, then the meaningful arrangements in CSM, classical statistical mechanics, become meaningless there. And hence, they should not have bearing in our calculation. They should not be used in our calculation. They should be done away with or reduced or dealt with in an appropriate way for the meaningless arrangements which we do in QSM, if we consider them as distinguishable. They're not distinguishable, they're identical there. These points are probably already clear to you, but it, there is never any harm in being absolutely clear. There is one thing is that they're clear, and the one thing is absolutely clear. clear. So number of microstates in this whole combination is maximum for the case of 2 comma 2. So that means the frequency is largest for this particular combination and hence the most probable distribution is this one, six, having number of microstates is this six. And this is the thermodynamic probability which will enter into the Boltzmann entropy relation, S is equal to K L and W. So with these points clear to us, now comes the probability which we have used many times, but at the back of our mind, it might remain that it is not very clear to us. 
so once we know that which states are accessible to us and which states are inaccessible to us then we have to remember that out of all the states that can be accessible what is the meaning of accessible an obvious question arises is define inaccessible states if you can't define accessible define inaccessible in order to define inaccessible states the answer is very simple the states which on which some constraint has posed the system i repeat some constraints have been report have been imposed on the system if you follow those constraints imposed on the system then all states will not remain accessible only some states will remain accessible and the others will become inaccessible why have they become inaccessible because of the constraints imposed on the system so let us assume that the number of states accessible to the system that means allowed by to the system who is allowing them the constraints are allowing them this is allowed this is not allowed then in that case <clears throat> we can say that for any isolated system which is reached a thermodynamic equilibrium all the accessible states are equally likely all the accessible states are equally likely and their probability is the same okay if that is the case then we can write that the probability of finding the system in any one of the accessible states will be equal to p is equal to 1 by omega 0 what is omega here the w that we were talking about in biser has now become omega in this particular representation so the probability here is 1 by omega 0 where omega 0 is the is the <coughs> the probability is 1 by omega 0 and omega 0 is as what i <laughs> defined so very good now out of this out of all these states we can number them 1 2 3 4 etc and then we can write that the probability of finding the system in any of the ith states is equal to omega i divided by omega 0 and if you want to find out all probabilities obviously it has to be equal to 1 so the probability that the thermodynamic system somebody raised the hand what is it so let me look at the question answers what is h in so manas mishra and rajiv i will have to whatever questions you ask i'll have to re i have to I'll have to repeat everything that i said till now in order to answer this what i shall suggest is the following i request you to kindly go through these uh, this particular chapter which i have already shared with you and then uh, you please talk to me on email i will again explain please give a reading to what i said and if you still do not understand as i said please pose a question on email so i cannot now repeat for the half an hour whatever i have been speaking till now however i will clear uh, your two doubts you see in csm in in classical statistical mechanics it is saying take the unit volume of the cell as small as possible i don't mind make it so small so small that you can fit only one particle okay if you want to fit 10 particles there make it large so make any number of particles sit in any number of states it is not putting any constraint it is kind of you know a free free kind of a mechanics and statistical mechanics is kind of a free in its outlook and perspective and it says on any level you can fit in any as many number of particles i have no problem a quantum says because of uncertainty principle it says no you cannot do like this you cannot make a volume which is smaller than h cube where h is the planck's constant if you do the uncertainty principle is is violated rigorous derivation of the violation of uncertainty principle while following a unit volume smaller than h cube has to be done in the masters course so that all all rigorous derivations cannot be fitted into the first level first you understand everything then you go about proving it rigorously i hope this answers your question to some extent so the sum of all probabilities over all states is equal to 1 and we get this summation over pi is equal to 1 now 
if you want to calculate the mean of a physical quantity say y bar then what do you have to do you must know the probability multiplied by yi and then if you substitute the value of pi you get this equation what are we trying to do what are we trying to do we are trying to one second where was it yeah so What are we trying to do? We are simply trying to understand why should we use probability? Why should we use phase space? What is the volume of the phase space? Why is it H? Where, where does this quantum mechanics seep in? How are they all connected? And what is accessible? What is not accessible? And so on. These are the simple things which should be crystal clear to us. If they are, then the any numerical problem reduces to application of three formulae only. Every numerical problem is just the application of three formulae only. There is nothing more than that in, uh, in statistical mechanics. Those three formulae have special uh, forms for the applications. So if it is applicable to fermions in a metal, or if it is applicable to specific behavior or helium, the only that formula is changing a little bit. So as would anybody who understands statistical mechanics share with you that Give 90% effort on understanding the concepts. Doing any particular numerical in this field of physics is just application of three formulae. And the, those three formulae, apply constraints, put in the formulae, plug in the constants, and you have a different form of it. But the distribution remains the same. And hence the mathematics or let's say complexity of numericals is much, much less. Now. Let us quickly recapitulate. What do you mean by types of ensembles? This figure is in so types of ensembles, micro canonical and grand canonical. A micro canonical ensemble is called an ensemble, which is not having any interaction with its surrounding, not having any interaction with its surrounding. So you see it has made a kind of a rectangle which is isolated from its surrounding by these walls. So it does not interact. This is called the microcanonical ensemble. In the canonical ensemble, there is a partition wall which is not rigid. So there is a heat reservoir and there is a system. So you can have two types of, uh, two types of interactions. The two types of interactions that you can do with your reservoir in case of a canonical ensemble is that you can have thermal, that means you can uh, exchange in a uh, heat energy. Secondly, you can have a mechanical exchange also. So pressure can be exerted and so on. Right? But in the grand canonical ensemble, this partition is such that it allows movement of one particle from, of a uh, movement of, sorry, particles from one compartment to the other and movement of particles from first compartment to second, say, and from second to one. Representing them by these simple diagrams is the following. Suppose you have a thermos flask with a ice cube inside it. Then you know that ice cube will melt slowly. Right? So there is interaction of thermal, mechanical and diffusion. But in canonical ensemble, no diffusion. Only thermal and mechanical interaction. Exchange energy with the reservoir. Change the pressure. Change the force. Mechanical force. It's okay. But not diffusing. Whereas microcanonical, no exchange at all. So in the beginning, we first of all study all cases with microcanonical ensemble and canonical ensemble. And then in the postgraduate cases, we talk about grand canonical ensemble also. So this is just to remind you that where we are and why three types of ensembles are used. For example, microcanonical is if you have a thermos flask full of hot tea, and if you make a collection of 100 such thermos flasks, then that collection is a collection of microcanonical ensembles. And here, if you have just thermal and mechanical, I hope it's slightly clear to you. So, so what are the fundamental postulates of statistical mechanics? A given macrostate is realized through an enormously large number of microstates. I just showed you a table. The principle of conservation energy will hold. 
in this connection the energy time uncertainty relation should be kept in mind what is this energy time uncertainty is the heisenberg uncertainty uncertainty principle applied to both energy and time so if you have lifetime of a state is delta t then the energy of that state is uncertain by a factor which is h cross by delta t we know this heisenberg's principle very well the equilibrium values of the macroscopic variables are given by the ensemble average of the corresponding quantities ensemble average means the average has to be calculated over the ensemble what is an ensemble an ensemble is a mental copy of the system which system the system which you have taken for consideration so micro canonical then micro canonical ensemble macro canonical then uh, macro canonical ensemble and grand then grand so the equilibrium values of the macroscopic variables which are the macroscopic variables pressure volume temperature entropy internal energy helmholtz free energy gibbs free energy and internal energy right so so we have all our basics correct and slowly by say tomorrow we will then jump easily from these concepts to a usage of partition function and its application to all the cases the uh, the the blockage in understanding is only till we get a grasp till the partition function once the partition function for the three statistics is clear in our heads the rest is just application of the conditions what are the conditions if you're talking about helium apply helium conditions if you're talking about a solid apply the conditions prevalent in a solid if you're talking about photons apply the conditions prevalent for photons in a black body and hence deduce black body spectrum if you're talking about phonons in a solid then those conditions and then and then rest all everything falls into place however <clears throat> building the concept of the partition function is what requires a little bit comparatively a little bit more more effort <clears throat> at this i think it's one hour by now so i will just uh, uh take a i will just take a break of 5 minutes i think one 5 minutes break is necessary for us to move forward i hope you are understanding how i am building a complete base of statistical mechanics with you to understand it and then after that i would like to get your feedback how the numerical has now become extremely extremely understandable to you and how it is now having a response in your brain of say few fraction of a uh, of a second but not more but not more let me look at the question answers and uh, and uh, so this is a break of 5 minutes i will continue a bit till i complete this concept so that the le next lecture of statistical mechanics will enable you to understand any will enable you to understand any book of statmec yourself and you will be able to do and deal with numericals yourself sometimes uh, so sonia asks sometimes product of uncertainty in position momentum taken to be greater than h not h by 2 pi y it this varies from book to book book but you see it is by h cross that it is defined i mean i really can't say why some book writes h and why some book writes h by 2 pi however this question quantum mechanics uh, experts would be able to answer probably in a better way however let me look up if i can give you a more beautiful answer so manas you said the phase space consists of momentum and space coordinates yes but planck's constant is related to uncertainty so how we can say that no volume should be less than h cross raised to some power we are not saying that any uh, how we can how the volume can be less than h cross the statistical classical mechanics does not know uh, the concept of heisenberg's uncertainty principle at all it is classical in nature and the concept of h cross or h the planck's constant h the alpha is not horse here it's a planck's constant is not acknowledged by classical statistical mechanics at all it is saying h is some alphabet you have chosen some alphabet out of your 26 alphabets is h it denotes the volume you don't like h call it a b c d e f g h why do we call it h because later on in quantum statistical mechanics we we do not want to change our um, alphabet 
we want to keep it as it is and then call it the planck's constant but if you are getting so confused you can say that in classical statistical mechanics the volume of a uh, uh, volume of a unit cell in a phase space is say a c q whatever you like yeah but we have only 26 combinations available to us so it says i don't recognize what is planck's constant i don't recognize what is h the planck's constant for me h is any alphabet and i'm saying the unit cell can be made as small as possible quantum statistical mechanics says it can be made small but not smaller than h cross q where h is the dimension because if you do that you violate uncertainty principle and if you violate the uncertainty principle you cannot follow quantum mechanics and if you can't follow quantum mechanics you cannot answer anything about subatomic space at all so you have to respect quantum and statistical together you have to definitely respect heisenberg's uncertainty principle and if you have to respect Pauli exclusion principle when you're talking about fermions if you don't do it you'll never reach an observation which agrees with your experiment how what you can say anything under the sun i can say this you can say that somebody else can say something else what will be accepted <coughs> only only that which agrees to the experimental observation and explanation of the phenomena that we are observing will be accepted rest will not so what is whatever is there in your textbooks to understand it's there because it has been tested again and again and found to be true right okay so we'll just give a small break of five minutes and then we continue further right is it okay miss mohinit and dr binder yes ma'am yes yes definitely Thank you. So you understood the concept partly correct, Sangeeta, but not completely correct. You see, an ensemble is a mental copy of the same system. When you say a mental copy of the same system, what does it mean? You consider a system. Let's say. You consider a solid or a metal, which is say one millimeter cube in dimension, right? This is your system. One millimeter cube, millimeter I said, not meter. One millimeter cube metal you have taken. Then you know which metal you have taken. You calculate the, you know Avogadro's number, you know the density of the metal. You calculate how many number of atoms are present in that metal. Very good. Then you know if it, if you have considered a metal, you also know its valency and so on, and you can calculate how many number of electrons are there in the metal which are free for conduction. You make you can make a good estimate. So let us suppose that number is x. You've got x number of free electrons in that cube of one millimeter cube of a metal which you have chosen from where from the periodic table. So you know its density. You know which element you have chosen. Now, this is my isolated thermodynamic system. It is in a particular situation. I know its temperature. I know its pressure. I know its volume. And by some gadgets which I have available, some detectors which I have available, some apparatus which I have available, I can measure its internal energy and this and that, all those quantities thermodynamic. So I know all about the system. And now I want to make it as an ensemble. Because now I will consider how the electrons within this small cube of metal, how their position and momenta are changing. So what I can do is either I can fix my eyes on this cube and note down, okay, position X, Y, Z is this much, P, X, P, Y, P, Z is this much. Okay, after some time, not time exactly, after some changing of perturbation, some kind of change in its state, like changing temperature. Let's keep everything constant and change temperature. If you say temperature, you're providing energy. If you provide energy, the momentum will change. Mass cannot change of the electron. So momentum will change. Okay, now what is the position? X1, Y1, Z1. What is the momentum? Px1, P, 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 X1, P, Y1, P, Z1, and so on. I can make 100,000 observations like this. I complete the observations and then I plot them in a three in a graph. 
I cannot plot a sixteen-dimensional graph, so I can take three three by at one time and can draw that, or I can keep some constant and then keep drawing three three and I can make thousands of graphs like this. What have I done? I've seen the different states of this system at different, not positions only, but in different momentum cases. In different momentum cases also. If that is the case, if that is the case, then instead of doing all this laborious work, I can simply say, I will make thousand mental copies of this one millimeter cube metal in my mind, and these thousand mental copies are now simultaneously in different position and momentum states. Which I can observe somehow simultaneously, and I can then draw inferential graph, inferential graphs simultaneously. So, the question that how will the ensemble behave? I can I don't have to do one by one by one. I can take it all simultaneously. So the ensemble is a mental copy of the system, and it is identical in size shape etc everything is it's a it's a mental copy like it's a xerox copy so you take up a paper there's something written on it you make a xerox of it then what would you answer regarding the fact that this mental copy of this is this copy xerox copy that you have made how it is identical to the original one that is your answer so i hope i have answered you so entropy and probability is where we reach now entropy and probability is where we reach now and then we continue quickly to understand how the three statistics are arrived at with their distribution and once that is done our differences are understood nicely and then we are at peace with ourselves everything is in its place and we are not missing some important piece of the jigsaw puzzle which requires understanding of statistical mechanics now since from the beginning we know that entropy is a function of the probability omega zero i have already spoken about prob prob probability omega zero so s is the function some function so nature of the function is unknown but we will discover this function i'll go a little bit quickly through it because i'm sure you know all this but i prefer to teach where everything is gone or uh, revised sequentially instead of you know saying that as you know very well you must be knowing this and hence i skip it it's a little bit uncomfortable to me as a learner so let us now consider two completely independent systems having entropies s1 and N s2 okay they are completely independent now you know what is an extensive quantity and what is a in extensive variable and intensive variable all extensive variables are additive in nature that means you can add them okay and entropy is an extensive quantity if you want more details about it just open any thermodynamics book and you will find out what are intensive variables and what are extensive variables so the entropy of the combined system will be the sum of the entropies of the individual systems because it is an extensive quantity it is additive in nature you have to add if you take 10 systems then it will be s1 plus s2 plus dot 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 s10 <coughs> so s0 is equal to s1 plus s2 basically we can say that for every microstate of one system the other may be in any one of the possible microstates why can we say that because again these are independent events if you have two states then if it can be in one state it can be in the other state also and that's the reason why you use a multiplication of omega 1 and omega 2 and you do not add it it is independent so theorem of independent events that was first the first thing i asked you about probabilities so s1 plus s2 is equal to function of omega 1 plus function of omega 2 and this will be nothing else but a function of omega 1 omega 2 Now, if you do a partial derivative, as you can see in the second equation, so you differentiate f with respect to omega one, keep omega two constant, and then you can write it as 
df omega 1 d omega 1. If you keep omega 2 constant, then the partial derivative of omega 2 will be 0, obviously. And similarly, you can do for omega 1, right? That means df of omega 1, uh, what is f? f is a function of what? Of the probability. Of the first, 1 and 2 does not matter. 1 and 2 does not matter. You have two states, you have two possible probabilities. We are trying to see the nature of the function. We are trying to see the nature of the function. And we know that the probability is equal a priori probability. And therefore, probability has to be multiplied because they are independent events. However, entropy is additive. Similarly, we can do with respect to omega 2, keeping omega 1 constant. Oh, sorry, I did not do slideshow. So, in 12.25, we have done it with respect to omega 1. Omega 1 is the probability for any one state. Similarly, we can do it for omega 2, which is for another state. And then what do we see? We can see that f omega will obviously have a, a function. Uh, f omega will be having a type of a function which is equal to k ln omega plus c. Now, detailed derivations you can do, you will require, say, two minutes more. Now, looking at equation 12.28 itself, we know that f is logarithmic in nature. And the constant k will be same for all systems. Now, you can use some uh, nice, beautiful logic. I will not go very much in detail about it because that requires really a, a bit more time than what is available to me. We can identify this constant. So using this equation number 12.28, we can write a change in the entropy. What have we learned from 12.28? We have learned that the function omega is something like entropy S, and this is equal to K, which is a constant. What is this K? We don't know yet. And it has to have a logarithmic function. So the dependence on omega is ln in nature. And there will be some constant. Very good. So if we now use 2.28, and if you write to, try to write the change in entropy, why change in entropy? Because you know from thermodynamics that entropy is not directly a measurable quantity. You can only measure the change in entropy. You can never measure the entropy of a substance. You can ask, what is the change in entropy of the system? or a change in entropy of a substance from that well state to this state, initial to final. What is initial? Initial is what you have seen. And final is where you have made the system to come after changing its pressure, volume, temperature, or any quantity. Any quantity which can affect entropy. You know entropy is related to other thermodynamic quantities through the Maxwell's thermodynamic relations. So we'll see that S2 minus S1 is equal to K ln omega 2 minus K ln omega 1. Very good. And that is equal to K ln omega 2 by omega 1 because it's a logarithmic function. So you see the mathematics is extremely simple. It's, it's student friendly. So substitute the values and then you can calculate the change in entropy. You can work out these equations by looking at the book yourself. So do not be perturbed since all equations cannot be included in a slide right now. So you calculate the change in entropy. The change in entropy is dependent upon what? That is important. The steps you can manage yourself. It depends upon V1 plus V2 by V1. Okay. That is what we have got from equation number 12.29. That is, I repeat, you have understood that whatever we were talking about just till now, we were talking about accessible states, non-accessible states, entropy, probability. And then we were we all were always saying, you know, this beautiful equation S is equal to KL and omega. Well, how did it come? Why out of the eight quantities, P, V, T, S, U, H, A, G, why did you choose entropy? Why do we say that entropy is the bridge between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics? Because entropy is directly related to probability in this manner. So, very good. We can calculate the change in entropy for what? For say a gas and we can say that it depends upon the equation 12.30. Fine. Then, for an ice thermal change, uh, one equation seems to be missing here. 
So you can readjust 12.30 in the form of a specific heat at constant volume. I'm sorry I missed this equation here. It will be as follows. Delta S will be equal to CV, specific heat at constant volume, ln T2 by T1 plus R, plus R, the Rydberg constant, uh, so, sorry, the gas constant, ln V1 plus V2 by V1. So that's available in the book. Please cross-check immediately after the lecture. So for an isothermal change, the first term on the right-hand side of this equation will drop out. And that is why you have this equation. So uh, from this equation, 12.30 to 12.31, I just missed a step where the representation was given in terms of CV, the specific heat at constant volume. So this was the second term of that equation, which I missed. And here we see that the uh, the first term will drop out, which is that first term, the specific heat one, and you have R ln V1 plus V2 by V1. And is the S constant R divided by the Avogadro's number, and this K is the Boltzmann constant. And that is why in the relation of S is equal to K ln omega, we have this K, the constant equal to Boltzmann, K, the constant equal to Boltzmann, a Boltzmann constant and hence this beautiful equation is called Boltzmann entropy relation and is one of the most fundamental relations of statistical mechanics. I as a student always wondered out of all the eight quantities of thermodynamics why did Boltzmann pick up entropy? Why not something else? If entropy is connected to all the other seven quantities through Maxwell's relations well then the other quantities are also connected to entropy. Because this disorder, this chaos, which entropy signifies, and entropy being an additive quantity, can directly lead to understand or to make us understand how the probability that we are talking about, how the microstate, macrostate, and distributions that we are talking about can be directly related. So it states that entropy of a system is proportional to the logarithm of its thermodynamic probability. Therefore, statistically speaking, the universe always tends to change towards statistically more probable state and the more probable state is that of more disorder and more chaos. Okay. This is just to bridge up all connections and then you see, you realize that it is also automatic and so logical. And then you're not perturbed because of, uh, you know, concepts just popping up from here and there. Why was this considered and why was that considered? And well, good. So with this classical and quantum statistics, now any microscopic system can be described in two different ways. A single particle or a group of particles can occupy any one of the several possible states. That is classical statistics. And quantum state can be occupied by any of the several particles. That is quantum statistics. We know this. So if you look at equation number, if you look at figure number 12.1, then here we say that the classical picture is as shown in figure number A and the quantum picture is shown in quantum in a picture num in figure number B. Now, <clears throat> quickly we come to a summary of, quickly we come to a summary where we can understand, where we can understand uh, this particular, uh, table so group energy particles and cells so you have one two three four and so on that's a group energy you can have one two three four particles n1 n2 n3 n4 and so on and i then ng cells you can have what is what do you mean by cells here cells simply means smaller uh, smaller uh, so substrates in an energy level or if, if you're talking about a box then smaller compartment in big compartment and like that so in Maxwell boltzmann statistics we deal with distinguishable non-interacting or weakly interacting particles. Say atoms of a perfect monoatomic gas. What do we do? We calculate the number of ways omega in which we can distribute all the particles among the groups and cells. So what does uh, statistical CSM say? Distribute all the particles. No problem. There is no restriction on the unit volume. And then what is the next step? You maximize ln omega to obtain the most probable distribution. 
what are the constraints to be followed total number particle constant total energy of the system conserved and there is no limit the last line is most important there is no limit on the number of particles that can occupy a particular scale cell this is directly coming from that unit volume which i have tried to explain in great detail with you if you want to understand it in further detail you are most welcome to read up chapter number 6 of rife berkeley series where the whole concept whole chapter has has been devoted to why classical statistical mechanics follows this particular ideology what is canonical distribution and how they both are leading us to calculate the various steps or the various components of a, any statistical thermodynamic system okay and now rest of the equations that come forth are very well known to you you know how to choose n factor n a small m number a small n one number of particles from a capital n and so on so i will not go now step by step through these equations these equations are doing nothing else but they are choosing say five particles out of 10 making a combination then whatever is left suppose you take choose three particles out of 10 particles available to you then what will be the relation 12.34 how many are left out of 10 seven are left then you can choose two then so on and so forth and then simple mathematics leads you to calculate capital w capital w which is thermodynamic probability here and then we can write uh, please look at equation number 12.36 this is simple mathematics choosing few particles out of a bigger number of particles step by step by step and what do we get capital n factorial divided by summation over i n i factorial capital n over n i and zero factorial is obviously one so pi i denotes the product of n i for all values of i product of n i what is n i choosing some particles out of a bigger number two out of three uh, one out of three two out of 10 five out of 10 such like examples so choosing all such things one by one making different permutation combinations and combining we have this beautiful formula right so just glancing you through all this and hence and hence the thermodynamic probability of n distinguishable particles whose wave functions do not overlap whose wave functions do not overlap why do they do why do they not overlap because they are experiencing no interactions amongst each other that's our assumption and if they are interacting with each other it is so weak that the wave function does not overlap and hence they are called distinguishable so when there is no limit on the number of particles occupying a cell the most probable distribution is obtained by maximizing ln omega b subject to the conditions on the total number of particles capital n and total energy of the system again in order to calculate 12.37 you need to calculate ln omega b and that you can do and that you can do by remembering n is constant and e is constant so classical says this beautiful function gi to the power of ni ni factorial and in quantum statistics if we treat particles as indistinguishable energy as quantized and defines various levels and occupancy of a state as a fundamental quantity so again you can see for fermions the same chart the particles are indistinguishable no distinction between the different ways in which any particles are chosen since fermions are governed by pauli exclusion principle the number of particles in each sub level will be one or none this implies that gi must be greater than 1 or equal to ni yeah this is famous for fermions only and some of the energies in different quantum groups taken together gives the total energy of the system so e conditions this n conditions remains the same once again we can go through simple two step mathematics and we obtain here equation number 12.39 or 40 which is the thermodynamic probability for an assembly of fermi fermions that is gi factorial the degeneracy ni gi minus ni 
So you choose some number of particles, you write down all the equation, do the multiplication and you have omega ft. Similarly, you can do for bosons. So you now you see it is just repetition. So if you want to know the number of ways in which Ni bosons can occupy GI sublevels subject to the following conditions, we have to remember they are indistinguishable and they will have uh, levels from 0, 1, 2, etc. But bosons love company. They are gregarious. So I will just uh, relate you a nice, uh, an, a nice little story about it. I will relate you a nice little story about it. And the story is the following. That when once Paul Dirac uh, had uh, come to uh, India and uh, he was meeting Satyendranath Bose. And he and his wife were sitting at the back side of at the back seat of his car. They said to Mr. Bose, why don't you join us? And he grinned and said, it's all about statistics, right? So with the bosons or fermions. So who will fit into the back seat of the car and who will not fit in? So with these words, we see the division of box into compartments. And hence, we can similarly calculate omega BE. The mathematics looks complicated, but it is not. It is simply a multiplication of choosing different number of particles from a total N, and hence the final distribution, which you all very well know of. Ni plus GI minus one factorial divided by Ni factorial GI minus one. So the most probable distribution is always calculated by taking delta L and omega is equal to zero and remembering these two equations, which are the overriding constraints. That is capital N remains constant and capital E remains constant. So delta Ni is equal to zero and summation over EI delta Ni is equal to zero. So with Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, we can calculate the same thing, calculate L and omega, Calculate ln omega and put it equal delta ln omega and put it to zero. So first equation is the distribution of omega mb. Then you write the log of it. Then you equate delta of ln omega equal to zero. You get the middle equation where summation is written, and then in the end the last one. And similar, and then moving forward, moving forward, you can obtain ni is equal to gi exponential. Please remember that exponential, which we talked about so much during our lectures in the past uh, four or five days, is equal to minus alpha plus exponential minus alpha plus beta ei. So ni, the number of particles in the ith energy state, is equal to gi, the degeneracy of that state, divided by exponential minus exponential alpha plus exponential beta ei. So we have reached back to where we were in a different uh, way. And we have understood how the three statistics in a similar manner can be understood. However, I suppose, however, I suppose we are now clearer with how the three statistics are represented in different text materials. What do they mean? How do they arise? And what are the different subsequent steps in order to get this distribution? So I'm not doing these in details, as you can see we reach back in the same way to get Ni for the Fermi-Dirac distribution law. So, and then we apply bose einstein statistics. And similarly, the steps are just the same. So they only just look different. They are not. And we will get for bose einstein statistics also in the same way, equation number 12.54, which is this equation. So I will now skip this mathematical part. This was just to ensure and to reiterate to you that the concepts that we have understood, if once understood, then they can be staying in our head as a normal knowledge and we need not either memorize them or load them and the recognition of the application of a particular formula onto a numerical or application is then very, very obvious to us and requires a response time of just a second, not, not even two seconds. So you see, we get the bose einstein distribution law in the same manner and so on. And then we can determine constants. These are just plain mathematics. And now we get, you see for the first time, 12.60, which is the Z is equal to exponential minus beta EI and start talking about the 
partition function. Start talking about the partition function. So at this point, I think uh, I would request you that instead of my going through this very simple, uh, uh, very simple mathematics, which is just trivial for you, if you have understood today's lecture, then you should be able to uh, make a beautiful garland of your knowledge of pearls of statistical mechanics and understand how step by step we have been able to understand from right from the beginning the entropy, the probability, the microstate, and the macrostate, and reach to different distribution functions, right? Which look like having formulae which looks like as if they have come up from somewhere. However, they're very, very logical in concept. And this particular graph was the graph which I also showed in my second lecture of how the fermions behave and how the Bose-Einstein function behaves at two, different, at two different temperatures. So Fermi-Dirac, if you remember, we talked about electrons being filled with a particular energy level, which is the Fermi energy. You can also call it mu, the chemical potential and then the sloping of the curve, and then the sloping of the curve for, for both science and statistics. And this graph also is just a repetition. However, it reiterates from a, from a, a slightly detailed mathematical concept, but reaches back to the same behavior of Fermi-Dirac, of sloping exponential Maxwell-Boltzmann and Bose-Einstein when plotted against this parameter. Please remember the x-axis. The x-axis here is not the same as what we saw there, and therefore the nature is slightly different. So with this, I would uh, now stop sharing. What I've tried to do is, what I've tried to do is uh, reiterate, revise, clarify, whatever word you would like, to, uh, to explain to you the concept of Am I visible and audible? Smoinid, am I am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, there was an internet, there was a power glitch, that is why I was asking. So I have explained all this uh, to reiterate, and now you are capable of reading. Uh, you are capable of reading and understanding Beiser. You are capable of reading and understanding uh, 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 Loknathan and Gambhir, Gerd Bunsen and Ghosh, and uh, Chapter Six of Rife for canonical distribution. And then in one more lecture, we are back with using partition function to all different applications. And then you can use either Rife or Huang or Mandel or Patria to cap up and finish your understanding. So I hope uh, um, this plan of making you understand, understand the subject in all steps was fruitful and useful to you. Do uh, give your feedback when I ask for it regarding this. So I will most probably take only one more lecture of statistical mechanics and that should be sufficient. You are advised to kindly go through the videos of Dr. Aditya and Dr. Sanjay Kumar after this lecture so that what they also spoke uh, becomes in line and uh, falls into place in increasing your understanding, right? And further, uh, I have shared the PPT with you and you should be able to then follow it uh, in great detail, right? And uh, from tomorrow, from tomorrow, I'm starting off with nuclear physics with you, where we will go from the graduation to the post-graduation level in step-by-step -step manner, right? And probably some other subjects will also be taken care of in middle. And uh, on from 15th onwards, uh, you'll have, so tomorrow, from tomorrow itself, we, will, we are starting with nuclear physics, and this will go on till up the master's level. So you will have a very good understanding and hope you enjoy. Yeah. So with this, I, uh, with this, I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you very much.